Time for a lucky time explosion. Today's guest is Adrienne Mumon. She makes collage. Get down, you hogs. Pull some art that's got heart, that's got style and good graces. Welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast. Lucky time explosion. Wow. <laughs> what is that maniacal laugh? My word. I almost just passed out from lack of oxygen. <laughs> nice. Ooh. We have a collage artist today, don't we? We do. I'm very excited. This is one of my favorite. Adrian Moomin. Adrian Moomin. Woo! So Welcome. She actually was one of the... Uh, the early members of Brooklyn Collage Collective going all the way back to 2013. Oh, nice. And yeah. she has a really, really cool process. She uh, does things a little bit different than most artists. Let us know. How do you, how do you begin? What's the deal? W would you say you do di things differently than most artists? Oh, well, my, thank you. My process is um, multi-layered. Just like the collages that I make, I start by walking around New York streets and photographing things with a medium format camera, and then I hand process that, and it's on, all on film. Right. And um, I hand process the film in small tanks, and then I make multiple prints of- Of the same one. Any, right, of the same image. And then I'll do a lot to them. I'll tone them for archival permanence in the dark room. And then I will apply dry mount tissue to the back of them. And then I'll hand cut and assemble them into geometric abstract collages, both two and 3D. So it's a many layered process. Oh, wow, so you're actually like, you're, you're coating them and backing them before you cut? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. I've tried it the other way and I was doing the same work twice. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you got, this is crazy. Like so many of the same ones. And then you kind of, when you say the multi-layered, quite literally, you're laying these images on top of each other. Yes. Uh, and creating kind of like a 3D effect. Exactly. Yeah. That's so cool. How did you and Morgan end up uh, meeting and, and joining the Brooklyn Collage Collective? Did we meet before Brooklyn Collage Collective? No. Oh, we met, we, I created it and then I founded you. <laughs> yes, founded you founded you. me. I founded Founder. you. I was non-existent before you came into my life. Yeah, yeah. My uh, girlfriend has uh, basically no one exists until you meet them. They're in a cocoon. Mm. It's called the cocoon stage. The cocoon so they don't stage. exist until you actually meet them. Yes. Like the like the movie with Wilford Brimley, uh, Cocoon. I, I hate to say this, but I think that your girlfriend might be a narcissist. I think that's really? a narcissistic trait to like believe that people don't. <laughs> Don't she probably, exist. She'll probably agree with you on that one too. Okay, cool. As long as we're in agreement, then we're we're all good. Yeah, I don't want to make her mad. She seems mm, lovely. No, nah, she'll just punch me in the face. <laughs> no, it's all right. I like that though, so it works That's out good. in the end. That's crazy. How many images do you make before you decide to start building it? Like, do you do you create like a certain number of them, or do you kind of like how's that? How do you decide how many to make before you start playing with them? As many as my drying racks will hold when mm -hmm. I'm working in the dark room or until I get tired, whichever comes first. Yeah. So this was a small <laughs> nice. image and I printed them two to a page. Mm. So I made, um, I think 30 prints of this. And um, so I ended up with 60 images because they were two to a page. And I think that day I like got started late or something. So I was like, okay, 30 is enough. I've got 60 images to work with. My collages are getting bigger and bigger, and it's like enough already, Adrian. <laughs> what is the biggest collage that you've ever made? Uh, well, I have one that's sort of long and skinny that's 96 wide by about a couple of feet high, and then I have one that's 83 wide by about four feet high. So I've been getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, that, that was part of the problem with me. Uh, the last piece that I've been, uh, the biggest piece that I've kind of been sitting on and need to mount and get ready for hanging is 10 feet by five feet. Uh. Uh, and um, I'm really excited to get that finished, hopefully within the next month and a half, and then I'll uh, let the world see it in person. Um, it's my masterpiece. Yes, it's coming. The it's big coming collage is coming to a from gallery. Oregon. Adrian, are, are you a native, New York native? I am. I'm Excellent. originally from Brooklyn. Nice. Before it was Brooklyn. Before it was Brooklyn. Yeah, it only had. Uh, Wait, wasn't hasn't it been Brooklyn since like 
1375. It had three O's. <laughs> it had three O's, but then I O's. think they switched it sometimes in the mid '80s to to two O's. Brooklyn. It used to be Brooklyn. <laughs> you're, you're making. You're messing with me. Ah, uh, no totally. way, man. This is fact. <laughs> That's cool, though. So um, I wonder, as a native um, artist who you said gets your inspiration from walking around the city, mm -hmm. kind of observing, like, what attracts you? What what do you do you know what it is? Or is it just something kind of unconscious that attracts you to your subject matter? Yes and yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I do. I concentrate mainly on urban architecture, architectural mm -hmm. elements, um, urban landscapes, store windows, mannequins. Mm -hmm. um, things of that nature. So the- um, The kind of stuff that's out there for us to look at. Anyway. Exactly, and a lot of which is going away with the overdevelopment and the knocking down of older older buildings. So some of what I shoot um, mm. 10, 15 years ago isn't even there anymore. Yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah, that's a thing that is very common here that I've noticed. I mean, I've been here since only 2008. Mm -hmm. So I've lived here a little, you know, over five, uh, 10 years, but it seems like it's just always gone that crazy. Like it's always just been churning over and recreating itself, the city. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is kind of a cool thing. And I wrestle with that idea of preservation and progress, you know, because like and at some points I really love the things that are kept. You know, I love being able to go to McSorley's and eat in a bar that like Abraham Lincoln was in or be able to go and observe some really, um, you know, important architecture. I think it's horrible that they, you know, knocked down Penn Station and built that thing that they did. Yes. But at the same time, I have people from my old neighborhood who are like protesting them knocking down the, um, it was like a, an electronic store, a really ugly building from like the 70s. It was like two stories. And they were going to build this big glass tower and have it be like a tech center or whatever. And the neighborhood was really upset about it. And I was like, why? You know, it's a two-story building from the 70s. It's ugly. <laughs> like, let it go. That's why, because you know? it's from the 70s. <laughs> That's For why. that reason alone. I Honestly. Mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's sad. Honestly. Like, you know, I'm, I'm in Bushwick, and, um, you know, all these luxury uh, residential units are popping up everywhere, and they're all made with styrofoam. It's all <laughs> styrofoam. Mm -hmm. It's you're, crazy, you're man. Not, yeah. like, you're not wrong. So much styrofoam. You know when you get close to a beach, you start to see the sand on the street and everything like that. Here in, in Bushwick, you, you see, you know you're in Bushwick when you see all the foam beads lining the roads <laughs> because that's what they use. So it's, it's insane. Are you talking My, about like a spray foam interior? No, sheets and sheets of foam that they then like kind of put cement over. Yeah. Wow. Like that's all the new buildings. And these buildings go up like this within three, within a month, you'll see like a luxury building yeah. pop up within like a huge one block radius. And it's, it's Bushwick is a strange area. Yeah. It, it's changing area. a lot too. I remember when I lived in Bushwick, it was, um, I saw this little um, coffee shop popped up that had all this classic Edison bulbs and light, you know, wood. And I was like, oh, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're going to have just like gourmet popsicles everywhere and everything's going to be $4,000 a month. But no, Myrtle Broadway held on. And full yeah. 10, 12 years later, it was the only thing like that around, still like a, um, mm. you know, a beacon for all the hipsters or whatever. And there was still just this crazy like Blade Runner nightmare neighborhood. Oh, it's still, uh, it's, still, that it's way. still that way. It's still yeah. that way. Um, but speaking of neighborhoods, you and I live in the in the same neighborhood now. So I forget. We're both in Upper East Side, right? Yeah, mine is technically Midtown East. Yeah. Midtown, because you're yeah. a little lower than I am. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how did you get there and how long have you been there? Um, I've been there since 1991. Wow. And um, I got there because I was working at this job that I hated um, in the building next door to Trump Tower, mm. and I was late every single day. Mm -hmm. And I was living in Queens, and it was a nightmare getting into the city in rush hour every, every morning. And um, so I was looking for an apartment in the city, and I found my place that I fell in love with it as soon as I saw it. I looked at a number of others, and I this was like only the fourth or fifth I saw, and I was like, oh my God, I love it here. And it was a 10-minute walk from that job. Ooh. So I figured, oh, yeah. that will stop me from being late. Well, guess what, folks? Did it, did it. <laughs> nah. no. Made it worse. You, you kind of, yeah. yeah. She kind of yeah. does. <laughs> more sleep. Yeah, no, that's I- That's what you needed. More, more procrastination. Mm. But that's why we do that. Like, I hear this about New Yorkers a lot, and I definitely lived it. 
when I was in the Lower East Side, which was that, you know, we tend to, if you can, if you can get lucky enough, it's like, the, it's like striking gold here. If you work a couple blocks away from your place, like mm -hmm. in the city. So I was in Manhattan, I was living a couple blocks away from the gallery and I did not leave a four block radius <laughs> ever. Like ever. It was like a five, four or five block radius. Everything I needed was there. Yeah. yeah. All the people came to me to do the nightlife things. We ran our shows. It was so much fun. Yeah. And I loved that about it because like something about being here and living in your little neighborhood, but knowing you could just like walk for an extra 20 minutes and you're in a whole nother neighborhood. I think it's really special and cool and very, um, it, it can be a little bit like cloistering, but I feel like artists tend to do that to themselves anyway, because you got to stay in the studio for so long, yeah. cranking out collages yeah. and you know artwork and trying to play with new materials Ooh, excuse me sorry bong that everybody that was the gong show he has restless leg syndrome i do apparently <laughs> kicking this and kicking that some people are just kickers you know they yeah kick shit around the streets you know obviously one of the big problems right now especially in bushwick is rats and uh my good friend al was talking about you know just walking down the street la di da had no idea. Rat runs out and he just drop kicked this thing about 10 feet across the street. Sick. Didn't even mean to, but it was just upon reaction. This guy, he said it was the squishiest kick. Kicked <laughs> that rat like 20 freaking feet across the fucking street. <laughs> but that's what's going on. That You know you're in Bushwick when you're kicking rats. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. And horrifying. It was, uh, at the end of the winter, I, you know, I have a glass door uh, in the front of my building. And I was headed out to work, and I just see this fucking huge dead frozen rat like right in front of my door, you know? And like the thing was completely frozen. I had to like shovel it up and throw it in a garbage can. And it's, uh, it, even his tail was like as stiff as a freaking bamboo <laughs> stick, man. Did you take some pictures for your collage uh, art? <laughs> no. First? You should have. I don't like them guys. Yeah, you have nice clean work. Both of you guys make really kind of clean, One nice, thing to bring up, work. you guys know about the Rat King, right? I know what a rat king is. You know what the rat king is? No. Oh, Adrian, you do not want to know, but I'm going to tell you, <laughs> it's a myth from what I understand. I don't know if it's they actually a exist. You, not they a do myth? exist. So basically, a rat king, oh, God, it's, it's something like all these rats get their, their tails tied into a knot, so they become this one massive, move. I'm sorry, massive <laughs> moving rat fest that, that cannot yeah. become untangled, and that is called the rat king. That's the rat king. And it's how do their tails get tied into a knot, though? By burrowing together, like trying to, you know, stay warm. And they all burrow together into their little nest. Oh, and when so there's it's too a... many of them, <sighs> and they just, they stay there for too long for some reason. It's pretty rare. It's a rare occurrence, but they find them all over the place. They found them, like, shipwrecks. They found oh, really? Them in, so they yeah. are real? Yeah, they found oh, them in shipwrecks god. and things. Oh god! You don't see it a lot because New York rats are smarter, all right? New York, New York rats are eating the pizza. They've gotten the brain power from the... The delicious dollar pizza. You know, at night they they have orgies with the pigeons. You yeah, know? they team up with the pigeons. Then they have that the pigeon rats. DNA, and but so it makes it, it even smarter. We haven't smarter. seen them yet. They live very deep down. The the hybrid pigeon rats. Oh man, <laughs> flying rats. It's just a matter of time so till they come out of the you know the the manholes. They it's like it'll be like uh, Ghostbusters. You know, in yeah. the first Ghostbusters when they take over the city, but it'll be flying rats. There we go. I can't um, wait. I hope living on the eighth floor saves me from that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they'll just be hitting into the side of the windows. Yeah, we'll be good. I'm on the eighth floor too. That's fine. Oh uh, wow! You know, both eighth floors. Yeah, it's a nice view. It's good. I got it lucky is. that we like. There's no thing really across the street. Like all the buildings across the street are are like five floors or less. Same. Nice. Same. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah. I love spying at people on their roof. Do you ever like go up on your on your roof? I I can't because mine's a co-op building, um, so it's. Someone's apartment is up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those, That's the penthouse. Yeah, the penthouse. Have those... you ever caught anybody spying on you, maybe? Um, if you point, you're like, hey, what's up? Thanks. I'm going to put on a show. No, I, I, I don't think I would be able to see them looking at me because they'd be so far away. You know, I got lucky that way. Mm. It was my neighbor <laughs> when it happened to me, so I saw them. Yeah. No, I'm just joking. So yeah. when, was the, when was the first time you guys exhibited... Uh, Adrian's work at the Brooklyn Collage Collective. Was that in the basement and somewhere in Bushwick? It was, Probably. wasn't it? Probably. And yeah. I forgot the guy's name. He was interesting. Um, he made a piece of artwork where he took all the roach clips of all the weed he uh, smoked and turned it into a sheet of paper. Like he put them all together. I thought that was really interesting. Um, but that was like 2000 and uh, probably, yeah, end of 2013 or beginning of 2014. 
have to go back on my Facebook and see when the picture was taken. I know. But um, yeah, that was a long time ago. I had a really cool crew. Uh, it was me, you, Jay Riggio. Um, oh my God. I Allie. Allie. Damn, I have bad memory. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah, Don't all drugs, those cats. Kids. They were great. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so um, you've, been, you've been making this kind of art for a very long time? Uh, almost 25 years now. Yeah. Nice. Uh, have you been, uh, have you shown with any uh, places other than BCC? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. What's your favorite uh, gallery that you've gotten to shown with? Or, or do you have representation right now? Um, I don't, although someone who I was represented by in Colorado, when he closed his um, bricks and mortar gallery, he kept his website up. So he kindly kept my work and work of the other artists on his website. So I still. Very cool. I, I still. You know, in the in the ether, have representation. There you go. What's on the What's on the agenda for you next? Um. Well, working on this piece, and um, I'm actually a uh, few weeks ago I went to an architecture event. I'm kind of an architecture nerd. Ooh. Obviously, this is my architectures series. And that's part of the reason. Another reason why we we're into each other's art is that I use a lot of architecture too. Exactly. And I've always been, uh, you know, very drawn to your work for that specific reason. But also one of the amazing things is that all your work is basically black and white. It is. It is. Yes. That's really, really classy. Yeah. We have a, a, one of our listeners is an architect. I know. Oh, really? You know, we talk, and he enjoyed the architecture conversation we had last time. We're talking about our favorite kinds. And so I guess I got to ask you, what's your favorite building? In the My city. favorite you, building. You can pick three. I know it's hard. Thank you. Up to three. Okay. <laughs> three max. Well, pro <laughs> probably um, my top is the Star at Lehigh in Chelsea. Mm. I spent a lot of time shooting in Chelsea over the decades. And um, one of my early collages in this series is of that. And um, the Flatiron, of course, mm. which has its own issues it's right around the, the corner yeah how old do you think that building is the flat it's iron. from the 20s isn't it yeah i think it's like 20s yeah i can't awesome. remember but it's they, it's pretty easy to look up <laughs> so yeah. that is a googleable fact that yeah is, you can check that yeah out. well yeah. it's been in the news a lot the past yeah. year or so right because they've been renovating ownership changing well yeah there's a there was a consortium of people that owned it and they really weren't doing anything with it. They weren't keeping it up or whatever. Mm. And it was kind of perennially with scaffolding around it. Yeah. And then it went up for auction and somebody from Virginia mm. had the winning bid, but then he didn't have enough money. Oh. <laughs> so I think Oops. a new consortium <laughs> bought it, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I heard there's some, there was some uh, controversy over over it but yeah it's been a long it's it was one of the first flat buildings like that but i think the very first one was the times tower in in times square was kind of similarly mm -hmm. pointed and had this extreme uh, dip into it my yeah. favorite is still the um the darth vader evil building downtown the one that has no windows it's like 33 Thomas Verizon Street building? or something, the Verizon building. Yeah. Oh, I don't know that. It's it's like a brutalist skyscraper. It has like oh. no real windows. It has like giant vents on the side. Oh, I'm going to have to go look for that. Yeah. It Eventually, just, it's just going to lift off to outer space. Just be, yeah. <laughs> right now, right now, I think it's like the, the NSA has like their offices in there. There's like seven Makes foot sense. thick walls. Apparently, it's made to survive a nuclear bomb explosion. Wow. Absolutely crazy looking, though. It's very ugly. And I love it. <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a big brutalism fan. Yeah. I love brutalism. Uh, but my favorite is uh, because of the deco is the Empire State Building. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan? It's like, yeah, architecture. We're talking about it in the main, in oh, the first yeah. place because of your Sorry, work. Sorry, the Chrysler so, building. Good God. Yeah, of course. I meant the yeah. Chrysler. Yeah, Chrysler's best. Yeah. <laughs> bad new yorker bad. bad man okay sorry i cut you off what no, were you saying all right so um a few weeks ago i went to an architecture event at mm. brickworks which mm. is right right near here in the design district and um they're having a sort of a competition now um to design a handmade brick huh. and it was quite the event and um so I'm in the process of working on that, working on design ideas. And they were really nice at the event. They gave us a big coffee table book that they published. About bricks? Um, 
about BRICS, and it sort of was um, summarized in the presentation. They had some architects there who talked about buildings that they designed in institutional, mostly college campuses and things throughout the country using handmade bricks from this company, Glen, Glen oh. Gary, it's called. So I've got the book and I've got some ideas and I basically have to sit down with the book and see what's been done and try and figure out whether what I have in my head is actually achievable by right. brick makers. Even though they've got some really talented people there, so that's the next thing. So on, are you? On are you agenda. Is this a, their hope is to innovate on the humble brick? It's they want to make a new brick, a brick for the future. Well, yes and no. Mm. Everything is yes and no. Multiple causation. Actually, I'm a big fan of that, and I think there's a lot too. There's way too much like polarization happening right now. People I need totally to realize agree. that there's not an easy answer all the time. Never. Like in the middle. Almost, I'm a, almost never. Almost never. I'm a filthy centrist and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I'll, I'm, not a, I'm unapologetic about it. <laughs> We're not asking you to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, they're taking something that was typically used in the past and has fallen out of use and bringing it into the present and the future mm. because environmentally it's it's a really sound building material yeah. um it is a pain in the butt though with repointing and dusting everywhere that's true i have to say that that's true i've but, lived in enough brick buildings in the city that are like built in 1865 but <laughs> if you look at what's new yeah. that's being done i don't think they used mortar oh between yeah between the bricks oh wow i don't think so just solid it's like just solid a little bricks. super glue. Bloop, bloop. Well, because well, I'm sure they have specific cements yeah. that are that are meant for bricks, but um, they're not just the flat, straight bricks that we're right. used to seeing on buildings that are just sort of in that brick pattern. I think that's actually what more it's like called. a puzzle. Mo well, some of them are more like a puzzle, but even the shapes of the bricks have like it's flat, and then there'll be a semi-pointed part sticking mm. out. It's almost like another brick was offset at an angle and glommed onto it the corner of it. Yeah. So there's all sorts of configurations and the way that they lay them, some of them are, you know, kind of undulating throughout the surface of the building, some of the building facades are curved. So there's all sorts of amazing things yeah. that I learned at this presentation and that's, that's why cool. I'm looking forward to delving into the book and just, you yeah. know, doing some drawings and I've got some geometric diagrams that I've been researching. So I'm excited to see what you, so you how you make a, a new brick. A brick engineer. Brick engineer. Hopefully. Do you guys hopefully. know that brick uh, collection is a thing? That people have a brick I collection? You, must ha you have to have a lot of space for that. You do have to have a lot of space for it. But I, f I discovered this when um, the studio was at. We had like some construction going on or destruction from the place next to us. So the, the building next to us was around since like 1800s, right? It was a really old building. But it wasn't historically marked. It wasn't something special enough for them to save. So it was getting demolished for a new hotel. And we went out there into the demolished yard and picked up a few of these bricks that had little markings on it. And the dude at the time, it was like, oh yeah, I'm collecting them. I'm going to take these and collect them. And I was like, sell them on eBay or something. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I went on eBay. Sure enough, go on eBay right now and type in like collectible brick. You'll be shocked. There's, oh like, there's like hundreds and hundreds of them. And they all have like little individual, like it's, it's like collecting art or collecting artifacts. And I'm fascinated by it. I want a brick collection, but I don't have enough room for it yet. <laughs> don't get me going. Now I'm like, I need me some bricks, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> comics. <laughs> yeah. Give me them bricks. And that it reminds me of the, um, the Supreme Brick. The when, Supreme Brick? Is that like the King Rat? No, like Supreme, the skate <laughs> company, released oh. a brick. Uh, and Supreme's notorious for having people like line up, you know, to oh, try and buy their shit. shit. That's crazy. When and did this like, happen? That was like a few years back. Like and they just had a back. brick that said Supreme on yeah, it? Yeah, it was a brick that said Supreme. It was $80 oh. and it sold out instantly. And everybody was like lined up around the block to get this brick. And everyone was making fun of it. And then I was making fun of it too. <laughs> and then I found out that brick collecting is a real fucking thing. And, I was and like, now okay. someone's probably reselling wow. it for, who knows, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I mean, anything yeah. with the Supreme. Oh, this I is going to help me with it. my research. Thank yeah. you for mentioning. Yeah, definitely go and check it out. Because, yeah. like, um, you know, you're you're going to create a new generation of brick. So well, you got to know what people value now. Yeah. She's going to change <laughs> the world. I'm we trying. We all are. Through bricks, yeah. one at a time. <laughs> That's an interesting concept. I know we only have the few minutes left, but like changing the world through art is something that I hear a lot lately. 
and from two people who I really respect and uh, who are both into, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a frog in my throat this morning. Ooh, they they jumped, jumped off, off my sweater. <laughs> oh, we both made the same <laughs> joke. Yeah, it came off my sweater I'm usually wearing. Um, but I've had like our last guest, Avalon, and then before that, J um, T uh, TK from Up Magazine. They both were into going into politics before. And then they said that they felt that they could affect the world better by focusing on art. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Like changing the world through art? What do you hope your art does for people? Or do you just kind of do it and 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 let people interpret it? Yes and yes. Yes once, and once yes. Once again. Nice. Um, it's really interesting. I really love this story. It's very recent. Um, a bunch of us on Facebook were having a discussion about art world, art market, whatever it was. And people just kept on jumping in, thread jacking right and left. And one person said, well, well, I just make my art for myself because I know that I haven't been successful in the market. I can't sell it, whatever, whatever. A lament a lot of us have difficulty mm -hmm. in selling and marketing. So we're talking about, um, you know, what are you going to do with your work, getting, getting your legacy in order, documenting your work and making sure that it gets placed after your death. And I said, you know what, even if my work all ends up in a dumpster, which it very likely will, um, if I touch people in some way, if I inspire people with what I do and a little piece of my gifts are kind of passed on that way, um, then I will have done my job here on the earth. That's what I hope to do. And I feel like that's what happens because very often when I show my work to people, they feel inspired to go and create their own work or to look at the world or to look at objects in a new way. And they express that to me. That's cool. um, the last show I had, a man came up to me at the opening and he said, if everybody saw the world the way that you did, the world would be a better place. That's beautiful. And I was like, awesome. oh, be still my heart. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what, what nicer thing than that could someone say to you? So yeah. I feel like I'm doing something that's helping people, even if only a small, minor way. That's I feel 100% the same exact way. Yeah. Yeah. There's exactly. only so much you could do in one lifetime unless you're a vampire. <laughs> That's true. I need to remind myself that often because I, I have a tendency to like want to put my fingers in every pie and you know and go spread myself too thin you guys so. want to go find like some underground vampires and just like give it up and go with it and live for like thousands of years no. yeah sure okay yeah no, you want no you want yes yeah <laughs> i mean you know you can end it all all you have to do is walk out during the day that's true i suppose but i think that's very painful from oh what i've, I, seen, I've in, seen a lot of movies. movies and they seem like they're in great deal of pain when they they're on fire on the sunlight <laughs> oh my god so Adrian, where can people find your work to see more of it we've shown a little bit on the screen talked a little bit about it and this this piece you brought today with this light post that you're working on uh is a great example of it i'll take a photo of that and throw it up on our instagram follow us on instagram on tiktok and on clapper if you're on there but yeah where's your site where can people go to see your stuff oh it's my name adrianmoomin.com nice adrian Mamoon. and adrian spelled a D R I E N N E movement.com. Go check it out. Go look at the work and let us know and let her know what you think, right? Absolutely. How do you how do you feel about feedback? You like feedback, right? I love feedback. Yeah, it's hard to get sometimes. Oh, I it's never it. hard to get. Everybody always likes to tell you what they think. <laughs> you, you know yeah. what they say about opinions, right? Every, yeah, everyone's got one. And they all stink. <laughs> yep, that's good. That's a beautiful way that. to end it. That's all a right. good one. Well, definitely check out her work. Keep an eye on Brooklyn Clutch Collective. Keep an eye on the Solus calendar. We have a lot of events coming up that that's you true. may want to be a part of. And you should look into becoming a member because then you could do things like this. You could be a guest maybe. maybe. You know, join the Solus crew. And don't forget to subscribe and like and share with your grandparents. And tune in next time for another episode of Lucky Town Explosion! <laughs> Yay! It's time for a Lucky Time Explosion. Today's guest is Adrienne Mumman. She makes collage. Get down, you hogs. Pull some art that's got heart, that's got style and good graces. 
It's like time explosion in your faces. Some odd that's got heart that's got